Welcome back. It is now time for our State of the Nation discussion. In the past week, Kenyans have been holding their breath, waiting to hear the president announce his new cabinet. But the exercise has remained a closely guarded affair and no one, not even the State House spokesman, knows when the list will be read out. This week also saw the maiden commissioners of the Salaries and Remuneration Commission wind up service after six years in office. They were praised and criticized in almost equal measure. And a week after Parliament resumed from a long recess, the legislators coined a new way of getting more allowances by changing the rules to allow each member sit in at least two committees. When in studio to discuss these issues, I have a lawyer, advocate Oliver Kipchumba, also a political researcher, Brian Aguya, and uh, we were expecting Gem, a member of parliament, Alicia Viambo, who has not been able to make it for this conversation. And last but not least, we have a Collins Mango, who is also an advocate. Gentlemen, many thanks for joining us on the State of the Nation discussion. Let's begin with the, the Salaries and Remuneration Commission coming to a close of its uh, six-year term. And like I mentioned, praise and criticism in equal measure um, at the end of their term. It was the inaugural uh, Salaries and Remuneration Commission. Let me begin with you, Oliver, in terms of uh, uh, taking into account their failures and their successes six years later. Have you seen a difference? I'll say being the inaugural salaries and remuneration commission just that alone is an achievement because mm -hmm. they laid down the structures they came in at a time when the the disparities in terms of salaries was way too high people doing the same job but earning differently people working in different government departments doing the same job but earning different uh, uh, types of monies mm -hmm. and also i think what they have achieved is to try and even put our members of parliament who are known for a very high appetite of increasing their own salaries mm -hmm. to a stop. They might have had some failures in terms of we expected it to kick off and to see, we see the wage bill being cushioned at the earliest time, but we have seen the wage bill continues to balloon at I think a rate of 11%. Mm -hmm. So I think that has been their failure. But all in all, uh, out of 10, I'll give them a seven. Mm -hmm. For the, they have done a good job. For even now we know what every civil servant should earn. We at least know, basically we know, at the basic minimum, we know that if you are doing this job, this is the value you are bringing to civil, mm -hmm. to civil service and this is what you should earn. But I think what they fail to do is to give us a way of paying people for work done. Right. Not for what perceived to you, your perceived value. Uh -huh. I think we need to reduce the whole discussion to the value addition you bring when you come to this work place in the morning. That is what we need to pay you for, not the papers you purport to bring on board. Because what will work is the value you bring to us uh -huh. at that juncture. So all in all, I think they did a good job. Now, and now let us go to the second one. We see what the, 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 the second commission now should be able to be in a better place because the infrastructure has been laid down. Most of the reference materials are there. The job valuation has been done across the board from counties to national government. Now the second one should be able to fly from the, the preparation made by the, the inaugural uh, the inaugural commission. Right. Now, uh, Brian, the um, public wage bill has actually increased by about, um, you know, an excess of about 200 billion shillings from the time the term of the commission took office to the time uh, the commission finished its office. And we had Sarah Serembe saying it, it's actually going to skyrocket in the next few months. Currently, the country needs about an additional 85 billion shillings uh, in remunerating civil servants alone. But uh, Oliver here seems to think they've done quite a bit. We at least know how or what somebody is supposed to be paid. But is that happening? We do know the information of, you know, what, uh, you know, what a certain job group is supposed to be remunerated, but the public wage bill is still skyrocketing. Where is the gap there that the SRC has not breached? Actually, what is happening is, and uh, I agree with uh, uh, Oliver mm -hmm. to some point, uh, because you can see the SRC are uh, the people, I mean, the, jo the different job groups. People are being paid, uh, but uh, the main concern to me should be the, the actual value. You know, when we say that the wage bill is skyrocketing or it's about to go high, mm -hmm. then it means that we still have some uh, bottleneck somewhere. 
in terms of uh, value or in terms of uh, service delivery. So uh, as much as we are having the SRC trying to really uh, remunerate, trying to really reach out to the county governments, we still have a lot of, just like the evolution, it had a lot of teething problems and uh, SRC had its own internal uh, disagreements, mm -hmm. you know. So what is happening is uh, we should really look at the, 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 the how Sarah Serem uh, led the commission, you know, then uh, as she exit, then we should now come up with a plan, a plan to ensure that uh, the country, you know, the economic status of the country is not so much at harm. You know? Right. Yeah. So basically, I, I, I think they really tried, and I won't really step on them so much. They mm -hmm. really tried. All right. So yeah. once we get to the um, employment or unemployment impacts of that, but let me hear uh, from you, calling the failures and successes of the Salaries and Remuneration Commission. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Michelle, for inviting me. Uh, before I go, uh, go to your question, um, it will be uh, first I'll start with uh, passing my uh, condolences to the uh, family and constituents of Kitui West. Uh, having interacted personally with uh, Francis Nyenze uh, and the family, I think uh, the country has lost a great leader. Uh, may his uh, soul uh, rest in peace. Uh, but to come to your question, uh, I think uh, SRC uh, in being the, f uh, the, f the first team of commissioners uh, really tried to uh, carry out their mandate and uh, I'd also be not very far from the uh, seventh grade that uh, my good friend Oliver g g gave them uh, uh -huh. in terms of uh, what they've been able to set out uh, in terms of you know standard standardizing uh, you know the the, the wage bill across the public uh -huh. sector uh -huh. and uh, also you know uh, taming uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, our legislatures in, you know, the frequent acts of uh, adding the salaries. Uh, but maybe to look at some of the challenges that they've had, uh, I mean, they've uh, faced a lot of, you know, uh, political uh, pressure from the legislators themselves. And uh, also, you know, uh, them not being able to be, to come as, you know, neutral parties in some of these uh, big industrial uh, disputes that we've, we've had. I mean, we've seen uh, teachers uh, had a very long strike during their, their as much as TSC is the employer. Mm -hmm. I think also LSR, SRC being stakeholders uh, could have been involved. Um, we, we saw the, the recent uh, medical strike by doctors. Uh, we also saw the nurses strike for a very long time. And uh, those are some of the challenges in their, you know, uh, kind of duties. And uh, as stakeholders, I think uh, maybe in the next, uh, the next commissioners that are coming in, uh -huh. they should also have a part being, you know, neutral arbiters in these kind of disputes. We find that uh, these are usually very big disputes in terms of the employer and the employee, the employer being these commissions, the teacher service commission, the county governments in terms of uh, when it comes to the medical field. Right. So uh, I think going forward, uh, because uh, I know industrial disputes are uh, not coming to an end very anytime soon, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, with the economy being high, uh, people are demanding higher salaries. And uh, to meet that, uh, we are having a, a time and again need for collective bargaining right. agreements being signed in the different sectors. So uh, going forward, I think uh, these are some of the things that SRC should now try to look into now that uh, they have at least standardized the field in uh, the public sector, the uh, public service, uh -huh. in terms of civil servants. All right. So yes. according to SRC, the public wage bill needs to come down from 52% to about 36% to be able uh, to better standardize the public wage bill. And of course, uh, reducing the public wage bill means more revenue uh, that will be channeled towards development agendas in, uh, in, in the country. Uh, but again, the number or the rate of unemployment in the country is still rising. And we've seen promises being made left, right and centre um, from the political class. The Jubilee government now is promising about 1.6 million jobs uh, for youth in the country. Uh, let's take a look at uh, a, a research that was done by Trends and Insight Africa, TIFA, um, and it shows that like, about 56% uh, of those in the informal sector are the ones providing the bulk of jobs in the country, not those in the formal sector. And so it, it raises questions as to the number then of civil servants and public state officers we have that are counting for this ballooning wage bill when a majority of the country uh, is still underemployed. So let's take a look at that uh, information there uh, by TIFA Trends and uh, Insights Africa and uh, some of uh, uh, the information that they are showing there that one in every two Kenyans is unemployed. So that then means that half the country is unemployed. And it also says that 
66% of the country's jobless population falls between the ages of 18 and 34 years. And that's even more damning because this is the most productive lot uh, of um, the, the population. Let's discuss that, first of all, uh, for a moment. One in every two Kenyans is unemployed. But here we are spending 56% of our national revenue uh, towards the public wage bill. Where, again, uh, Oliver, would you say the gap is? And how do we include, then, the majority of the Kenyan population into um, employment opportunities? When you talk about unemployment, we need to, 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 to see and to, look, to have a look at the various factors that influences unemployment. Mm -hmm. First of all, it is very sad that we, are, we live in a country whereby a, a paltry few consume the 52% right. of the budget. In terms of, it should be the other way around, whereby the majority consume the amount. But unemployment, I will say, will not be solved by government alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It will. It it needs a collective, and a convergence of minds to see that we have ideas on the table that are not in itself forcing government to create jobs, mm -hmm. but everybody. Like for the for, for example, from our institutions, we should not produce people who come outside after graduating tomorrow, all they seek are jobs. They sh we should graduate people who are job creators mm -hmm. instead of job seekers, which, which means we need to invest more in, on innovation and other things. Because at the end of the day, even if we say a government will create jobs, are they sustainable? If the economy is not growing, where will the government sustain those jobs? Mm -hmm. In terms of saying a government is the primary employer of most of the people, but we need to move away from that traditional thinking to a point whereby when we have 10 youths, among the 10 graduates, we have four job creators. Mm -hmm. And then the, the six will be employed there. Right. And then again, we have other methods of, of job creations. There are various ways, but at the end of the day, we need to ask ourselves, are we trying to go to ask government to just employ people for the sake of having people busy? Mm -hmm. And we may end up having the kind of thing we had in NYS. Right. So right. all these must be looked at in terms of value addition. Okay. A value addition. Uh, again, Brian, um, the ability to sustain the public wage bill is directly linked to the government's ability to deliver on the promises that uh, they have made to Kenyans, you know, in terms of revenue. How dedicated uh, would you say the Jubilee administration has been in their first term uh, in terms of combating the public wage bill? We saw a lot of statements coming from the president. We saw a lot of um, uh, promises being made in terms of slashing uh, the salaries of some of the state officers, including the president himself. But have you seen that commitment to continue fighting this? In just a moment, we'll be speaking about the move that MPs are now using uh, to add to their salaries. And we haven't seen um, you know, anybody from the presidency or the executive come out strongly to discourage this as a bit of reducing the public wage bill. OK, uh, before I answer your question, let me just add on to what uh, Oliver said regarding uh, unemployment. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a population that are largely consumers and are not producers and that will narrow down to our education system what are we teaching our children in schools mm -hmm. we are training them to okay work hard then get a good paying job we are not teaching them the art of making their own money being their own bosses so I, I believe that the new curriculum that is being introduced by the Ministry of Education will aim towards, I mean, creating that awareness of people being growing up in a more producing environment mm -hmm. than a more consuming environment. Look at it, we have one million, almost one million students gradu graduating annually right. for very limited job uh, positions. Less than a year they graduate again. Where are we creating the opportunities? Are we instilling or where do we expect the opportunities to come from? Mm -hmm. Now, coming to your question on the Jubilee administration, I mean, me, most Kenyans voted on Jubilee uh, voted for Jubilee based on their manifesto, right. you know, based on whatever they promised that they, were, they would deliver. But if at all Jubilee delivered their promise, then we couldn't be having almost half of the population unemployed. You know, in every, uh, of every two Kenyans sitting together, one is unemployed, mm -hmm. you know. So that really underscores Jubilee when it comes to creating jobs and sustaining their, what, what we see, what we see are just manual jobs. We see Kazi Kwabijana, we see politicians calling young guys, telling them, okay, we have to dig trenches here, we have to plant grass there. That is not sustainable. That is not sustainable. So we have to 
bring Jubilee, we have to bring them into account and really challenge them with sustainable ideas. And we hope they will adapt to these sustainable ideas that will ensure that entrepreneurial skills are enhanced or are, are, or are encouraged among the elite. Mm -hmm. You know, 18 to 34 years, that's a very crucial age. That's an age whereby young guys are really brilliant, and that's the age whereby if you don't make it in life, you'll opt to any other option. Why are we having a lot of criminals? Right. Why are we having a lot of youth in drugs and substance alcohol abuse? Mm -hmm. Because of unemployment. We really need to sit down. We really need to sit down as young guys and pull our intellectual resources and financial resources. That, if we do that, we won't be able to, I mean, we, we won't even need the government as per se. If young people can just sit together, pull the intellectual and resources together, they won't need the government so much as they need it now. And again, young people must understand devolution. Mm -hmm. You know, young people must also go to the counties. Many people are still finishing school, then still coming to Nairobi right. to, to, to job seek, you know. We need to know that Money, power has been decentralized, and we have, a, we have a working county government, and we have a governor who we should know his mandate and who we should know our roles as youth. And that includes also calling for public accountability, mm -hmm. you know. And it's great that you bring that up because looking at the numbers that we're seeing, the rate of unemployment, does this now signal not just a breakdown within the public um, wage bill, but also a breakdown in the system of devolution itself? Uh, because devolution was meant to bring resources and services closer to the people. So we have less people uh, coming to crowd uh, Nairobi and going to crowd Mombasa. But seemingly that doesn't seem to be uh, working very well. We still have, um, you know, in fact, an even higher rate of unemployment than we did five years back. Where are we getting it wrong in terms of using devolution to strengthen the youth, Collins? Uh, yes, um, just before I get to your question, and it's good we've, we appreciate that when you talk of government, we have two types of government. That's uh -huh. the national government and the county government. But uh, to be honest, uh, we might talk of all these other ills, but uh, in all honesty, the buck stops with the government. I mean, uh, it's up to the uh, government to come up with infrastructure, um, facilities, you know, and all these kind of activities so that uh, to ensure that uh, their citizens are employed. And I mean, Kenyans are taxpayers. Kenyans pay their taxes uh -huh. and they need to see good use of their taxes and they want to see also value for their money. I mean, it is very uh, painful to educate your child, I, I know, for parents up to university master's level and uh, they're unemployed. I mean, if you cite the recent, uh, the two suspects of the uh, bank robbery, mm -hmm. you, you clearly had what the, the sentiments the, the, the parents shared, which was uh, not very, very encouraging. But uh, to come uh, in the role, about the role of devolution in uh, employment, I think uh, county governments must in this term, I think we've now had a long, uh, this now more than five years mm -hmm. since we've started devolution. And uh, county governments should now, you know, take their part, take also their lead in terms of uh, coming up with programs and, uh, you know, uh, f uh, so that they can facilitate uh, employment of their, uh, you know, constituents. And um, also in the same thing about the public wage bill mm -hmm. and the high percentage, something that I must also note, um, as much as we have a running SRC commission uh, that is trying to, you know, limit the, the, the wage bill of the public, there are some ills that if are not uh, ch uh, looked checked or looked into, we will still be back to the same problems. I mean, something like corruption. Uh -huh. You cannot be cutting on the, on the wage bill and uh, billions are still being lost in the same breath. Right. So these are discussions that uh, Jubilee in this second term should take on bravely and we should now see action, not just talk. We should see the government tackle the, the, the dragon of uh, corruption. Uh, also, another big factor in this thing of unemployment is things to do with nepotism. Mm -hmm. And these are things that uh, Kenyans, we should now discuss. And uh, uh, there's also the issue of uh, national inclusivity. You know, people feeling out that uh, jobs are being given to certain communities. So these are also some of the ills that uh, in this term that must be looked into by the government. And it must be very serious and candid discussion. All right, so let's take a look at what more um, that uh, research by Tifa Trends and uh, Insight Africa had to say about the rates of unemployment. And it continues to say that only a paltry 6% of those who were uh, sub took part in the survey were listed as uh, self-employed. So again, uh, indicating that uh, um, information in terms of entrepreneurship and self-employment is not as rife as it should be in the wake of um, the rate of unemployment. It also says that above, about half of of those who are unemployed have been jobless for at least one year. And we've seen this big problem for graduates, especially when they asked uh, for things like uh, job experience. Um, but again, this brings us back to matters uh, devolution, Oliver, even as we wind up on the topic of uh, <clears throat> um, uh, the economy. 
So yes, the Jubilee administration has promised 1.6 million jobs. It is a promise by the Jubilee administration. But we have politics there, and that trickles down to county governments. So far, we have talks of having county governments that are opposition-leaning and county governments that are Jubilee-affiliated, which is a conversation, I think, as a country we should not be having um, to, to, to begin with. But do we need to start taking county governments accountable for the fact that con their own constituents, their own residents in their counties do not have enough job opportunities? Do they county governments or uh, can the county governors do they have a leeway to point a finger at the president for inability to create jobs when they have not been able to do the same within the county governments michelle that speaks to the quality of leaders we elect at the county level mm -hmm. when you elect substandard leadership material we cannot have standard ideas to run the county. That is why we go back to the same narrative that the president must create jobs. When you have a county, and the notion that a county government, and that we have opposition-leaning counties and government-leaning counties, should not arise because the constitution says that county governments and national governments are interdependent. Mm -hmm. they, they are two layers of governance. You cannot have the other minus the other one. We need, we need county government the same way we need a national government. Therefore, the duty and the mandate of any elected governor and its assembly is to make sure that they work around their different problems in their counties to make way for jobs. And this does not and uh, is not limited to employing people as advisors to the advice of the other advice. That one is limited to that. What we need is looking at the resources we have. Let's take, for example, Singishu County. We can go and talk about what we call agritourism, mm -hmm. whereby we create a new sector altogether, whereby we invest in agriculture to the extent that people come to view. We go to Israel to, to look at or to see what they do in the agriculture. Mm -hmm. That is a new thing altogether. We have very many avenues for counties to create jobs. The problem is our county governments are in a, ever an ending political mood whereby today we are talking about assemblies quarreling the governor, tomorrow we are talking about the governor having an issue with the senator, the other day it will be the governor having an issue with the women rep, protocol on who should speak first. Those are issues which we cannot entertain at this juncture. And the president has been clear that they will create 1.6 million jobs. Mm -hmm. What we need to move and ask ourselves is how will the Jubilee government create these jobs? And as we put Jubilee government or to deliver the same gusto and energy. We should use the same to ask the county governments. For example, have we asked the county government, each county should, should declare that uh, we will create even 1,000 jobs. Right. We will mm -hmm. be having 47,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. And they have the ability, they have the resources. What, what they lack, we have institutions for capacity building. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be tough on counties. And in terms of expenditure and matters of transparency, we should be tough on counties. We should now see the homegrown NGOs coming from each county, talking about transparency, matters of nepotism, as Wakili has mentioned them, so that we entrench governance instead of entrenching impunity all in right, those countries. All right, that's a great point. Um, because, of course, uh, at the end of the day, majority for, for majority of Kenyans to be employed, it will have to be self-employment and entrepreneurship. Uh, but let's come back now to formal employment, where we need to curtail and reduce that public wage bill. Um, as we wind up on this one, Brian, what would you say are the key issues for the new or the incoming commissioners of a Salaries and Remuneration Commission? Uh, basically, we had uh, the CBS... Uh, we had the uh, okay. We know we've, we've had a lot. We've had a lot of strikes uh, in the recent mm -hmm. past, uh, and still there's still that push and pull. You know, we need to have the new commission coming in and trying to harmonize, reach out to the uh, to the affected parties, be the doctors, be the teachers, be anyone who is affected by that. Then uh, we they, they harmonize, they harmonize so that uh, we can have services back to our people, you know, uh, because it it is really not in order. It is really not in order whereby uh, when uh, we have functions, we have uh, uh, groups that are supposed to deliver, but they cannot deliver. But again, we need SRC to be totally uh, autonomous. We need to be totally autonomous mm -hmm. because we realize that uh, we've had cases, we've had, we've had cases or indications that there were external interferences right. with the 
SRC in uh, effecting its mandate. So we, we really have to, the, the, the new commission that is coming in have a tall order. They really have to put the house in order so that they make sure that uh, they pick it up from, with Sarah, from where Sarah Serem left it and they really uh, do their mandate in a manner uh, that is uh, right to the law, mm -hmm. yeah, to, uh, yeah, to the rule of All law. Right. Yeah. Um, Collins, your thoughts on this as we wind up. What must the incoming commissioners of Salaries and Remuneration Commission do? Uh, yes, I think he's said pretty much uh, about uh, what the expectations of Kenyans, and I mean, uh, Sarah Serem has set a very high standard, uh -huh. and uh, that's a tempo that they may maintain. And one thing I, I appreciate about the previous commission is that they were not cowed, they were not bullied when they took their stand. They took, and I remember when they were down cutting the, you know, the salaries of the MP, the president. The speakers, uh, they, they went under sharp criticism, but they stood their ground. Mm -hmm. So we expect them to maintain the tempo. And as he had said, we have also uh, serious uh, industrial issues that we also need to uh, discuss in other sectors, that is, uh, uh, members of uh, the COUPET, NAT, uh, the, our doctors, you know, COTU, um, uh, you know, the, the trade unions. So um, going forward, uh, we are looking forward to uh, commissioners with the same zeal. And uh, I mean, if it's about trying out, they've seen, they've seen what they did. So uh, they really don't have an excuse uh, going forward. All right. All right. So let's move on uh, from uh, Matters Economy and the SRC and move on to President Uhuru Kenyatta's expect, expected cabinet. Um, President Uhuru Kenyatta is expected to reshuffle his cabinet any time now, uh, probably in the next uh, two days. But it's been a highly guarded secret. Um, nobody knows uh, you know, when this list will be read out or who will be uh, part of the list in the names. Uh, but let's focus on the fact that uh, Parliament will not be forced to sit an extra two weeks uh, to vet uh, the nominee to the cabinet, even as uh, members of the opposition, NASA say they will not um, participate in that particular committee, something that constitutionally would not hinder um, the entire process. But uh, in terms of factors that are going to affect or influence this cabinet reconstitution, Oliver, one thing that has not been discussed in greater detail is the issue of gender balance. In the president's first cabinet, um, the issue of the two-thirds uh, gender balance was not met. And many critics uh, you know, talked about the goodwill and the political will to implement the two-thirds gender rule. If we cannot see it from the very top, from the executive and the cabinet, how do we expect then uh, to see it within parliament? So far, we've had FIDA uh, that has uh, called out uh, to ensure that the president ensures about seven slots, I believe, uh, for female cabinet secretaries. Do you think this is top? of the president's mind in reconstituting his cabinet? Mm -hmm. I think to say that the, that will be top, I'll be, I'll be lying because I might not know what the president is thinking, mm -hmm. but being a constitutional threshold, it must be one of the issues that will inform the formula of coming up with a cabinet for the simple reason that for it to have acceptance by the people, it must have a level of gender inclusivity and for us to to take the government as being serious in terms of implementing the two-third gender rule mm -hmm. it has to start from the top but again we need to move the discussion from even the gender balance to what did the people or the members of the female gender who are in that cabinet what did they achieve mm -hmm. that is the next question we should ask or from where i sit i think we do not need to emphasize on gender and uh, devalue what the, 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 the input one will have in terms of the work they do for this nation. Mm -hmm. And gender in itself ought not to be an achievement. Right. The achievement is what you will do. But having said that, mm -hmm. that does not take away the issue of two-third gender. Absolutely. It should inform the kind of cabinet we have, because it is also a motivational factor for our sisters uh -huh. and our mothers uh -huh. back at home. Because when they see we have this cabinet, they say, yes, we can grow to this level. It is a good thing going forward. All right. All right so we'll be discussing that in a bit more detail um, later on. But uh, Brian, again, in terms of um, the factors that are influencing uh, this uh, cabinet reshuffle, what do you think will be the biggest influencer uh, for President Uhuru Kenyatta, considering that there's a lot of different forces under there? You know, his deputy with the succession politics. Uh, we have uh, women now crying out for gender balance. On the other side, he will have to try balancing um, this to try and appease the opposition. 
nation, so to speak. There is political gifts or rewards uh, that need to be given at the same time, and most importantly, the legacy that he needs to leave. Uh, you've just said the, uh, the, the political rewards. I think uh, our political loyalty, I mean, in our local context, as far as I've studied, as far as I've, uh, I've learned from our system, is that people will only get a slot based on their loyalty to their leader, you know. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, in, in, a, in a normal functional democracy, we should have women or rather any other person getting their work because of merit, mm -hmm. okay, Be, and because of uh, affirmative action, you know. You know, like, for instance, when I talk about affirmative action, I'm talking about uh, the, the special groups, you know, people with uh, interest uh, needs, you know. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is we know, I, I, I don't know what the president is thinking, but on top of the list I know, deep down is, he has to reward one or two. And again, uh, he should not forget in his process of rewarding one or two of uh, his loyalties. He should not forget that we have a constitution uh, uh, guidance that we should meet when uh, giving such like uh, nominations, you know. And as for women, just like he said, will you get your job according to what you deliver. You get a job according to the service you're bringing on the, on mm -hmm. the table. We can't just employ you because you're a lady, for crying out loud. Right. You know, we have, a lot, we, we have a lot in stake. Our children's lives are, are involved. Are you in a position to really come up with solutions that will really uplift uh, the, the boy child, the girl child in equal measures? It's not that you're a woman so that you're entitled because the rule says. That's just being fair. Uh, but women should own up. I, I, they, I, should, I, they should own I, up. I feel like I need to argue for the very basis of being a woman. We're talking about, about 19 to 22 cabinet slots. We have 45 well, million Kenyans. There's no it is a matter of merit, yes. But I mean, it, it, uh, how, how, why, why yes. is it so hard to Maybe open to come up to your no, 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 don't, don't, don't come to your <laughs> Let me deal with that. Now, Michelle. We understand. All I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm not like arguing that women should not be given these jobs. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying that women who are given these jobs, they should not just rally behind the mere fact that they are Gender. females. Right. You know, that's all I'm trying to say. Right. But allocating seven or nine or nine slots in a in a, in a, in a 21 or out of 21 positions, I mean, it's still okay. I have no issue with that. All I'm trying to say is we don't have to see women writing papers telling the president because they are women. I mean, letters give them jobs based on what they can do. All right, all right. Let's leave it there. Um, I'll come back to you, Collins, in just a moment. We should take a short break and release our <laughs> well, viewers watching us on our KTN home channel. Life and Style is coming up next. But for those who want to keep up with this conversation on the state of the nation, do stay with us. Money Express comes back after this short break.